Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jacqueline Mulwick of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. This webinar is a part of our summer series leading up to the Lean HR and People Development Summit, as well as our CADA Summit, also known as CADACON. I'm excited to bring to you today a short webinar facilitated by Dorsey Sherman. Dorsey MHSA has been pursuing her passion for healthcare improvement for 15 years. Most recently, she formed an LLC called Modele. I'm not sure if I said that right either, Dorsey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Consulting, whose mission is to help overwhelmed and burned out leaders achieve their potential and close the gap on daily improvement by learning and internalizing the Toyota Kata thinking pattern. So please note that this webinar will be recorded in case you want to refer back to it later. And we will have some time for Q&A at the end. So if you think of a question while the presentation is going on, you can send it in to us through your GoToWebinar panel. If you look on your panel, there will be a tab called Questions. Just click on the arrow to the left of that and you can submit through there and we'll address them at the end. So make sure you get them in ahead of time so we can make sure we fit that in at the end. So for now, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dorsey. Thanks, Jacqueline. Hi, everybody. Um, as Jacqueline said, I'm Dorsey Sherman. I'm a consultant and a coach, uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, my business is called Model Consulting, which actually means pattern um, in French, which you'll understand the connection to pattern here in a minute and um, if you're familiar with Toyota Kata. So I help companies and individuals um, achieve their potential by focusing on scientific problem solving, leadership coaching, strategy deployment. So I've been practicing Toyota Kata as a learner, as a coach, uh, as a second coach for a few years. And as I presented kind of my learning and development and, and results, people always say, how do I, how do I get started? So that's um, the objective of this webinar is to give you kind of my perspective on that question. So before we get into how do you get started, I wanted to kind of do a baseline um, overview, kind of synopsis of what is Toyota Kata for those of you that maybe have heard of it but aren't that familiar. So um, Mike Rother is the author of the book Toyota Kata, and he studied um, the uh, for several years in um, at Toyota and was looking beyond the kind of visual stuff and into how people were thinking, how they were behaving, what their kind of daily activities look like. And what he found is that their behaviors looked like scientific thinking. They were conducting experiments, reflecting on learning, making predictions, comparing the plan to the actual, and um, managers were teachers of that way of thinking. But as he was translating this to practice in America, um, realized that scientific thinking is not our default. It's not what we do naturally as humans. Our brains have evolved to jump quickly to conclusions um, and kind of fill in the holes without um, any facts or data, but going based on all of our bias and assumptions about a situation. And so he really pulled in this whole element of deliberate practice with a coach. So Toyota Kata is the combination of those things. It's scientific thinking plus deliberate practice with the coach. And by deliberate practice, it really means um, kind of focusing on your weaknesses, um, uh, for short, frequent practice, feedback from a coach, and, and the deliberate practice part is what really can turn any, um, any of your, so your, your ha can create habits. So it turns scientific thinking into a habit, a meta skill that can be applied in any situation. So there's kind of two parts to Toyota Kata. The first is the improvement kata. So this is the four-step pattern, um, which is understand the direction, grasp the current condition is step two. Step three is establish the target condition, and then finally experiment your way forward towards the current condition. The second piece is the coaching kata. So while the improvement kata, so kata means routine, it's a routine you practice in order to learn a new skill. The improvement kata um, is a routine you practice to learn um, scientific thinking. The coaching kata is a separate routine, a routine that you practice in order to teach the improvement kata. 
So this is the five question card, which you might be familiar with even if you're not practicing Toyota Kata. What is the target condition? What is the actual condition now? Then a reflection on your last step. What did you plan as your last step? What did you expect? What actually happened? What did you learn? All of that is really part of understanding your actual condition right now. Then you turn the card back over. What obstacles do you think are preventing you from achieving the target condition? Which one obstacle are you addressing now? What is your next step? What do you expect? And how quickly can we see what you've learned from taking that step? So the five question card actually has 11 questions. So typically, um, this is kind of what a storyboard might look like. Um, this is the a description of a storyboard that's laid out in um, the Toyota Kata book. The idea is there's a coach and a learner, and they're practicing together. The coach is asking the questions, and the learner is answering the questions. Um, and, and typically, the coach is, is the superior or the boss of the learner. Um, and really, the whole purpose of the questions is to understand what the learner is thinking. So just like um, a music teacher will ask a student to play to understand how their skill is progressing, by asking the questions, you understand what the learner is thinking. And then kind of teach and direct to stay within that improvement kata um, pattern. So the two practices of coaching kata and improvement kata are linked together, but they can also be kind of decoupled. So one kind of really interesting way is to just um, use the coaching questions and, you know, going into, you know, your next meeting or your family conversation or reflecting on your own personal goals. You know, what is the target? What is, where are we now? What's the actual condition? What obstacles are preventing you? So even though um, in organizations, they've often done a lot of lean training and, and A3 thinking and rapid improvement events and value stream analyses, what I found is sometimes people have a hard time answering those, those just those three questions. And, and even those questions alone could kind of shift the conversation and really add some value um, when maybe a meeting or a conversation isn't productive. So how do I start? So with kind of that basic Toyota baseline, Toyota Kata baseline out of the way, here are my four ideas on what you know to get started. So the most important thing I think that you need to consider is something called mindset. So um, there's a book um, called Mindset by Carol Dweck, and in it she describes the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And when I and I think the term growth mindset is kind of out in our vernacular. It's it's um, popular in schools. My kids are bringing stuff home about it. They know all about it. And I had heard about it and sort of thought, yeah, I have a growth mindset. I'm flexible and open minded and self aware and focused on improvement. That, that I have a growth mindset. But when I read the book and kind of learned and understood more about it, I understood um, kind of the true meaning of a growth mindset. And so here's a quick definition. It's really the belief that our intelligence, our ability, our creativity, our ability as leaders and employees can be cultivated through efforts, through strategies, and through help from others. So the idea is that everyone can change and grow through application and, your, and experience, and so your potential is unlimited. And when you believe that, you're very comfortable embracing hard things, taking on challenges, um, realizing you're not sure how to achieve it, but keep going anyway. There's kind of, in a growth mindset, a passion for stretching yourself, especially when it isn't going well. And then the opposite of a growth mindset is something called a fixed mindset. And so that's believing that your abilities are carved in stone. So you only have a certain amount of leadership ability, a certain amount of intellect or creativity, and that creates this urgency to prove yourself. So with a fixed mindset, every situation is evaluated. Am I going to look dumb? Am I going to look smart or dumb? Will I be accepted or rejected? Am I going to feel like a winner or a loser? You hide deficiencies, believing that effort is bad. Effort means that you're not smart, that you're not a good leader. That's evidence that you're not smart. But most importantly, any type of coaching and feedback in a fixed mindset is more evidence that you're that you're not doing a good job. So this is a huge obstacle for moving forward with Toyota Kata because, of course, coaching is really the cornerstone of deliberate practice. If you're not getting coaching and feedback on your weaknesses, um, you aren't really learning and improving and cultivating, developing your skill. 
And if you enter this coach learner relationship, sometimes never having received coaching before, um, it can really be a hindrance to learning and, and thus result. So when I learned about this fixed and growth mindset and thought back over the last few years of my experience practicing Toyota Kata, I saw fixed mindsets all over the place, I'm included in myself. Um, so I'm kind of, for simple, to be simple, I'm saying, you know, growth or fix, but many of us are kind of combinations of both in different situations. But when I think back on the fixed mindset, it was people who didn't want to look dumb, you know, didn't want to say they didn't know, um, did feel the need to prove themselves and how smart they were by answering the question. So I think this awareness can be really important. A quick example of kind of comparing the two is, is them so the mindset's reacting to the same neutral circumstance. So you don't do well on a test. So a growth mindset, while they might be upset or sad, it's not to say that, they next time we'll try different strategies or study harder, talk to the teacher. They look at those who did better on the test and see if they could learn something. But a fixed mindset takes it as a comment on their character, their innate abilities as a person. I'm not smart. I'm actually going to try less hard next time because if I don't have the ability, why bother? I'll look at this test of those who did worse than myself to make myself feel better. And at work, I really, as I was reading the book and understanding more about it, I, I saw this, um, lots of examples of people kind of behaving in these growth versus fixed mindset characteristics. So who cares? Why does this matter to Toyota Kata? Here, here's my perspective on that. Practicing the improvement Kata is really taking a step into the unknown. Our, our typical mode outside of the realm of continuous improvement of achieving new results is, you know, we kind of do benchmarking, we go to conferences, hear about other things different people are doing, and then we make plans. So we create this action plan. And if we don't achieve the result that we intended, um, then we say that the plan was bad. But with Toyota Kata, there is no action plan. You set a target and then really experiment your way forward. And there's two reasons I think this is hard for somebody in a fixed mindset. Most importantly, you learn when you're wrong. So this is an example from the Toyota Kata book that this learning is really what happens when our prediction is different from what actually happens. That's where the learning happens and, and understanding that is what drives you forward to take another step. But if you have a fixed mindset, you're very uncomfortable saying you're wrong. You're very uncomfortable. Um, it, means, it means I'm not a good leader. It means I'm not smart. It means I should have known better. So the second thing is you don't want to say within you're in a fixed mindset, you don't want to say I don't know, because that too kind of says, I'm not smart, I'm not a good leader, I'm not effective, I should know this is my process after all, that I'm managing, why don't I know how things um, work or am able to predict the outcome of things. So um, what actually I saw is people are terrified to say I don't know, you know, they're terrified. Um, um, to kind of be vulnerable in that moment. But really the whole point of practicing Toyota Kata is recognizing that knowledge threshold where, um, and then planning our next experiment right there at that knowledge threshold to see what we need to learn next. So um, um, as the more I learned about this um, mindset and I just saw the application to Toyota Kata to be so strong, I was talking to other kind of practitioners and kind of I've read this book and what do you think and getting their feedback and so Mike Rother um, emailed and said um, yeah look at the Toyota Kata website so this is a quote from the home page that says Toyota Kata has only ex existed since 2009 but has already become a tried and trusted way to develop a test learn ad adapt growth mindset in any team or organization so his perspective is you practice Toyota Kata and it teaches you a growth mindset I guess when I read about it, to me, I wish I would have known. I, I think it can also be helpful in, in the reverse. Understanding a growth versus fixed mindset prior to start practicing, I think can really help you be a more effective learner and a more effective coach to recognize kind of those fixed mindset tendencies maybe in yourself. And if you're coaching, recognize them in your learner to encourage them then to say, it's okay. It's okay. I want you to say, I don't know. If you say, I don't know, that's a good thing. That means we've acknowledged our knowledge threshold and we're going to plan another experiment there. If you make a prediction and it's different than what actually happened, that's a good thing. That's how we learn and move forward and plan our next experiment. So 
to me, that framework and that structure is a really important context to keep in mind as you start practicing Toyota Kata and I think can help you be much more effective. So that's number one is mindset. The second thing is, so again, how do I start? And as I've done, um, again, this question gets asked a lot. And I think it's interesting because in ways the steps are laid out. You know, we have these four steps. There's multiple books out there. Um, and so I've kind of thinking about what does that question really mean? How do I start? And, and where is that coming from when people want that? And so to me, you know, my kind of hypothesis or what I think is comes from is this want, this need for certainty, for confidence and wanting to be in that green circle of, you know, that zone of certainty where I feel really confident. I know what I'm doing. I know everything and I'm ready to get started. Um, and so I think that's part of what that question, how do I start it, is really all about. So given that as a context, here, here's my answer. Just start. So there's this great book by Peter Block um, called The Answer to How is Yes, which I love because we get kind of stuck in this uncertainty and overwhelm, but here's the answer is really to just start. So our brains don't like uncertainty, and so we get stuck in kind of thinking we have to know everything, but really by just starting and practicing, you learn so much. So when I first started um, a few years ago, I went to a two-day um, training class and learned, um, you know, kind of the, the basics of Toyota Kata, came back and started practicing and did a ton of things wrong in retrospect. So the challenge in, you know, sit, understanding your direction or your challenge is setting this big goal that's six months out. Ideally, it's adding value to the customer. In retrospect, the first challenge we set wasn't adding value to the customer. It was kind of more of a tactic. Um, we didn't do a value stream analysis first. It didn't really connect to a broader strategy. Um, we weren't really sure how to do the five steps of process analysis in the current condition, so we kind of fumbled our way through that. We were working on office processes, and so the frequency that the process was occurring didn't match with the coaching cycles, so that kind of felt awkward. Um, um, I was working in a hospital. We started working with nursing, <clears throat> and their experiments felt like they were doing, you know, action steps, kind of tasks and not experiments. And so it was like, you know, this isn't working. And so, but we just kept going and showing up week after week. It was uncomfortable and kind of annoying. And um, I think we felt frustrated and confused, but all the while learning. And as we had those kind of moments, even though we didn't have any internal coaches that were developed, you know, we'd sort of go back, watch a YouTube video, talk to other kata practitioners that we knew, um, send emails, you know, we were able to go to conferences, learn more, and then just keep going. So I think there's this tendency to want to wait to do something until we feel confident and comfortable. Um, but, but really, I kind of have a the idea is that the opposite is true. So Dan Sullivan is a leadership coach and has this model relating to goal achievement that I think is totally applicable to um, Toyota Kata as well. And it's really, we want to have this confidence before we start something, but it really happens in the reverse. Um, the first thing is a commitment. So this take a leap of faith and commit to a challenge or a goal before we have all our I's dotted and our T's crossed. We're stretching outside into that zone of discomfort and then to have courage as the next step. So in other words, courage being the willing to be uncomfortable, to be frustrated and annoyed and to be in that learning zone. You've committed without any proof or evidence that you have ability to achieve this huge challenge. But as you commit and you um, kind of have that courage, then your capability grows. And from there, your confidence comes. So the idea that we want confidence at the beginning, but it really only comes after we go through this kind of tricky part of commitment and courage. So my third tip for getting started is to begin as a learner. So leaders especially, I think, want to jump right into coaching and see themselves as a coach, um, as a leader. Um, but, but remember, the coaching is really about teaching. And how can you teach when you haven't sort of deeply experienced something for yourself? So not only do you learn more about the improvement kata pattern, you understand that feeling of being vulnerable and of someone asking you, what is your target condition? You know, what is your actual condition right now? What obstacles are preventing you? 
being in that role of having to answer those questions and the feeling of panic when you don't know the answers and you don't want to say, I don't know, and you don't want to look stupid, that creates such empathy as a coach and makes you so much more effective. There was a recent article in a Harvard Business Review called um, Most Managers Don't Know How to Coach People, But They Can Learn. And so the authors asked executives and leaders, are you successful at coaching your employees? So the answer they said was yes. Unfortunately, most managers really, not unfortunately, but most managers right now, I think coaching is such a common term that's used now and is really equated with just managing and telling people what to do. So the reason it's important to start as a learner is managers think they're good coaches and so they assume they can go right into the coaching role. But most managers equate coaching it with telling someone what to do and that's not the intention of the coaching kata. The intention of the coaching kata is really to understand what your learner is thinking and then to keep them within that corridor of the improvement kata thinking by asking questions and you know, giving guidance, but not necessarily directing. So my final tip for um, getting started with Toyota Kata is forget results. So what do you mean? How can I forget results? That's the whole intention. I, I want to do Kata and get these awesome results. You can, and I think you will, but when that is your intention of um, your practice every day, um, my experience is it doesn't go well. So if we think improvement is a direct line from A to B, we get really discouraged and frustrated and turn off that kind of curious and learning part of our brain. You know, this fixed mindset person, when it gets tough, they quit. It's not working. You know, it's not working how I thought it was. But really the growth mindset person is somebody who keeps going, especially when it's hard. And um, as the Toyota Kata pattern, especially right here depicts, you know, it's not a straight line necessarily. Um, what you thought was going to work well didn't work well and that's really the whole point is to keep um, learning when what you expected to happen isn't what you thought would happen. The other thing that I see is when you're focused on results um, there's a tendency to want to give the answer. So when I started practicing regularly um, you know, I know I wanted to have the right answer, and I definitely saw this in leadership too, and that's definitely a hard habit to break. The tendency is to say, you know, if I'm the coach who wants results, I'm saying to my learner, so what is your next step? They answer, I know that experiment won't work, try this instead. But when you're focused on the capability of the team, the capability of your learner, tell me more about that experiment. What do you expect from taking that step? How quickly can we see what you've learned? I was working with a nurse manager um, who was trying to improve the admitting process. Um, and her experiment that she wanted to do was send an email to her staff of about 15 nurses, um, kind of explaining to them the new process, the new standard work that it, she wanted to experiment with, um, her expectation that they would um, read the email and change their behavior and we would have a new standard in place. So um, she moved ahead and the next day we said, you know, what happened? Well, they didn't understand the email. They didn't open their email. No one is following the standard. We then had, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, a reflection about what did you learn? What did you learn from taking that step? What you thought was going to happen isn't what actually happened. How can we reflect on that and take another step? So there is experienced managers who would you know, have a tendency to maybe say, don't send that email, don't send an email to 15 people and tell them that, you know, and expect them to change their behavior. It's not going to work. That's really the, if your intention is to get results, that's the kind of coaching you're going to give. My intention is to improve the capability and the problem solving skills. Okay, you want to send an email. Why don't we try sending an email to two people? So let's lower the risk of the impact on a group of our staff where maybe we don't want to risk lack of engagement. How do we experiment on a small scale and try the step that you want to take and let's learn from it and see what happens. And when the learner experiences that, you know, not failure, but the difference between what happened and what they expected, that's really the learning that then goes way beyond um, the admitting process and that they're able to take you know, and to develop as a skill that they can apply to any situation. So here's my four tips in summary. 
learn about and really understand and develop a growth mindset. Be aware, not only in the people you're supporting or coaching or learning, but in yourself, how a fixed mindset may be holding you back from your own learning and development. My second piece of advice is just start. Don't wait for confidence because confidence really only comes from commitment and then that awkward kind of uncomfortable part where you have to be courageous. Confidence comes at the end after you develop your capability. Third is to be a learner first. You really only can teach. Oh, and one thing I didn't say on being a learner first, if you aren't, if you don't um, have coaches on site, you can really trade off as a learner and a coach and go back and forth. Um, so pair up with one as a learner, one as a coach, and then flip flop and coach each other. So that's what um, we did when we started um, practicing when I was at Mercy Health in West Michigan. And wasn't able to have a coach. We were able to flip flop and really build our skills as a, as a coach while being a learner at the same time. So make sure that you're in that learning role is very important. And finally, forget results, focusing on deliberate practice and um, learning that habit of scientific thinking and the results will come. Finally, there's lots of resources to help you. I highly recommend all of um, Mike Rother's three books on um, Toyota Kata. And I'm also um, would love to help. So my email is Dorsey at modelconsulting.com and you can check out my website as well, modelconsulting.com. Would love to talk with um, all of you as you get started practicing Toyota Kata and, and be a resource to you. So finally, hopefully you've thought of some questions and maybe thought of some things that I didn't answer and I'd love to hear um, what those might be. And Jacqueline? All right. Thank you so much, um, Marcy. So we will move on to the questions. I did want to say I found it very refreshing hearing someone say it's okay to say I don't know. I feel like sometimes <laughs> it's tough to do that, but whenever yeah. it's it's a good good reminder for people. Yeah, we did get a few questions that did come in, so hopefully we'll have time to get to all of them. If not, um, we'll we can figure out a way that you can follow up with people. Sure. Um, the first one, uh, first one here says one major factor for success is engagement and ownership of the transformation process by the leadership team and not just by the coach. What are your experiences with this? Um, ownership and can you say it one more time, Jacqueline? Ownership yeah. and engagement by the leadership team and not just the coach. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, what's my experience with that? So, yeah. well, ideally the coach is a leader. Um, so that would be the best way to create engagement is that, um, there's an agreement by the leader. Um, so, you know, so ideally there is a chain of command with the coaching. So while you don't want to go right into coaching, you want to start as a learner, but ideally that leader, um, agrees to practice um, improvement kata coaching kata as a learner and a coach and that's what creates engagement um, you know is there is there agreement to practice so agree if they're not willing to practice themselves um, you know that can be a little that can be a little trickier I mean I think if you start on kind of a, lo a lower level of leadership with like a manager supervisor coaching and learning um, and then bringing um, people to observe that and kind of to watch the process and learn about it. That can be another way to create engagement. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily wait for like this wide ranging engage, like buy-in or stakeholder and, you know, um, engagement from all of leadership before starting. I mean, that I, I really think it's important even to start on a really small scale um, and then kind of you know, build engagement as you go. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's, I feel like people can get some good tips from that. Um, another question that we got uh, regarding commitment. Have you come across situations when the learner or coach have overcommitted? If so, have you seen effective ways to get out of that trap? Hmm. Overcommitted. Um, so maybe like the challenge is too big or something. I'm not sure what overcommitted means. Um, I was going to say, I don't have much context with the question. Yeah. But okay. that so, be... Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I guess I'll just interpret overcommitted as maybe they set a challenge that's too 
you know, too big or they set a focus process that's too big, possibly, um, for sure. So all the time and, and, and me included. Um, and I guess follow up if, if I'm not interpreting over committed correctly. Um, but if it means setting it too big, that's just something you learn as you go. Um, that, you know, there's definitely kind of a skill to, you know, setting an appropriate challenge and setting kind of a scope of a focus process that's appropriate. So, and sometimes you set the challenge and here's something else I learned from Beth Carrington. It's not necessarily this linear process of step one, step two, step three, step four of the improvement kata. You might set your challenge, get into your, um, set your focus process, start understanding your current condition and realize your challenge might be a little out of whack. So, you know, you kind of take a step backwards, maybe your challenge comes into focus and then you go back to your current condition. So it's not like you can go into current condition or even target and never look back at a challenge. Um, you might flow back and forth between those four steps um, you know, as you're practicing and moving along. But but tell me if I've misinterpreted over committed. Yeah. So I'm thinking as as you're answering that, probably what we'll do is we've been getting a ton of questions in. I don't think we'll be able to get oh, to cool. all. So I'll send everything that's been submitted to you. And then um, for everybody who maybe hasn't been able to submit theirs yet, her email address is listed on your screen right now. So I'm sure you're welcome to have uh, people reach out directly, correct? Please, that would be wonderful. So I'll make sure to send all these questions to you as well so we can get those answered, make sure there wasn't any. It can be tough when you can't actually talk to someone face to face and know what they're trying to ask for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, that would all be right. great, Jacqueline. Yeah, um, we'll go ahead and uh, at least do one more and then I think we'll probably be over our time. I don't want to keep people too much longer. Okay. So the last one we'll get to is, have you implemented kata thinking and or coaching in an environment with no lean or uh, continuous improvement history and culture? And if so, how did that go? Um, yes, I have. Um, and it went very well. I just had this question the other day, you know, how do you know mm -hmm. if people are ready, are ready for kata? Um, yeah. um, I, I guess I don't. To me, that's kind of the just start kind of perspective is I don't necessarily think you have to be ready or not ready. That's to me, that's the beauty of um, the model, that it's relatively simple and that there's we know so much about deliberate practice that I think um, you can start doing that. So my family business is a um, food and uh, vegetable packing and canning business. And so I started practicing my brother runs this applesauce plant in southwest michigan and he knows zero about lean and um we just started i i kind of um he's, he's very interested in learning and development and always wants to try new things and so i said well you know why don't we try practicing and so i've been coaching him over the phone he has no background with lean but we started talking about you know what a challenge would be how that would look like and then we spent some time understanding the current condition of this one line of applesauce where he does these four ounce applesauce cups um and then started taking steps forward and it's it's working beautifully and and that's Another reason why, to me, I'm so passionate about Toyota Kata is I think you don't necessarily have to have training or understand waste or, um, you know, lean or Six Sigma or any of that. It really stands alone and um, is simple enough that it can be adopted um, in any situation. It's really a meta skill that's universally applicable. And really the Kata in the classroom, my brother's taking all of this, you know, to students and kids. I'm doing a Kata in the classroom exercise with third graders next week. So oh, that's um, awesome. yeah, so if they can do it, um, it's for sure can be applied in any situation. I think it works well. Yeah. All right. Well, there, like I said, there were a ton more that have come in. I'm sorry, we don't have time to get to all the questions, but yeah. um, I'll send all of these to you and you can follow up with everybody. Awesome. I will do that for sure. All right. So um, we're a little bit over our time. So everyone who's still tuned in, thanks for, for sticking with us. We just have a quick wrap up and then we'll call it a day. So Dorsey, thank you again for facilitating our session today. And as a reminder to everyone, this webinar has been a part of our free summer series. So if you're interested in hearing more webinars and learning more about this, you can visit um, www.leanfrontiers.com.
forward slash summer 18. And this has been leading up to our Lean HR and People Development Summit. And we also have had Dorsey speak at our Katacon previously. We'll be doing our fifth year in 2019 for that. So if you're interested in learning more about our summits, you can visit www.leanfrontiers.com forward slash summits and learn more about what's going on with that and register. So as our wrap up, I wanted to let you know this is being recorded. So you can look for an email following our time together for a link to the recording and feel free to share this throughout your organization. So again, thank you, Dorsey, and thanks to each of you for, for participating in today's session. Goodbye. Thanks, Jacqueline. Bye-bye.